straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Prosecutors in the George Floyd case seek to admit into evidence prior bad acts. Body cam video reveals the arrest of a 14-year-old boy who officers knelt on for 17 minutes. Plus, fashion designer Massimo Giannulli reports to prison for his role in the Varsity Blues scandal. And a man convicted of stabbing and dismembering his parents must spend the rest of his life in prison. What he says he now wants to do to his fellow inmates. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. New developments in the George Floyd case as prosecutors are pushing to use video of one of the former officers kneeling on the back of a 14-year-old under arrest back in 2017. Prosecutors say body cam footage shows Derek Chauvin kneeling on the boy's back for 17 minutes. Police were called to the boy's house after his mother said she was assaulted by her son and daughter. The boy reportedly was laying on the ground when officers arrived and did not get up. Two seconds later, Chauvin grabbed the child's throat and hit him again in the head with his flashlight. The boy cried out, Mom, and appeared to lose consciousness. He awoke a minute later and said he couldn't breathe. Prosecutors are arguing this shows a pattern of excessive force by Chauvin. Joining us now is attorney Dina Dahl along with Terry Austin. Dina, let's start with you. Chauvin's de defense attorney says his actions were in line with the department's policy at the time. Does that fact mean we're not going to hear or see this body cam video in a potential George Floyd case? Not necessarily, because he's probably also going to allege that the killing of George Floyd was also within the line, within department policy. The fact is, is did he use a pattern of using it intentional unreasonable force? That's what the prosecution is going to prove, and it's possible this might come in as that. Now, Terry, following police procedure at the time, that sounds more like a civil defense than a criminal defense. What do you think? You know what? Following police procedure is definitely a possible defense in a civil wrongful death action. And we know already that George Floyd's family has filed a wrongful death action against the city of Minneapolis and also against the police officers involved. I actually reviewed the complaint, and it does specifically state that the police officers fail to follow police procedures. So we'll see what happens in that case. But, you know, I think there's a good chance that the civil action is going to result in some, you know, damages as far as the plaintiffs are concerned. All right. Well, of course, keep an eye out on both cases, the criminal case and the potential civil case upcoming. Thank you, Terry. And now to California, where Massimo Giannulli has reported to prison starting his five-month sentence for his role in the college admission scandal. The fashion designer and husband to actress Lori Loughlin was admitted into federal prison near Santa Barbara. The couple pled guilty to paying $500,000 to pay to get their two daughters into University of Southern California. Loughlin began her two-month sentence back in October. Giannulli reportedly shaved his head and grew a beard to have a tough guy look. The husband of the late actress, Naya Rivera, is suing the county where she died. Law and Crimes' Anne Jeanette has the details. The lawsuit filed by Naya Rivera's husband, actor Ryan Dorsey, and her estate claims that her death earlier this year was completely avoidable. That lawsuit claims that the boat that she was on with her son lacked safety features and that they fell below Coast Guard standards. It also claims there wasn't an adult flotation device on board, but the coroner who performed the autopsy on Rivera said the boat had one. Dorsey is suing Ventura County, its Parks Management, and the United Water Conservation District. Dorsey said the lake where his wife drowned also didn't have signs warning about a strong current. Rivera was only 33. Her four-year-old son was with her when she went underwater. Searchers found her body days later. Ventura County declined to comment when contacted by Law & Crime about the lawsuit. For Law & Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. Thanks, Anjanette. And tomorrow, she'll bring us an exclusive interview with a former FBI profiler, John Douglas, on the case of a serial killer and white supremacist. And then one day in October 1980, I get a call from a, a, a Dave Cole. He's a supervisor in the Civil Rights Division. He says, John, we know you've been doing this research. We have this uh, offender named Joseph Paul Franklin. Uh, we don't know where he is. He just escaped now from a, uh, from a jail in Kentucky. He's killed over 20 people. Do you think do you think you can help uh, help us out? And I said, really? I said, I don't know. I said, I'll give it a whirl. So they said, come on up to headquarters. 
A Florida woman accused of killing her co-worker at a salon is reportedly down to just 74 pounds. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office is requesting emergency care, writing in a petition that Kimberly Kessler is trying to kill herself through starvation. She weighed 196 pounds when booked into jail. A judge found her competent to stand trial back in March. Now, deputies say she rubs feces on the windows and throws food when she becomes mad. She had another outburst during a pretrial hearing. Wait, I'm yeah. mute anyway, so I can say whatever the f I want. We're not on mute. Oh, okay. Uh, we may want to put her on mute while we finish this, Judge. Uh, it's fine. I want to just put me back on myself. Ma'am, come back. I want to get rid of the public defender's office. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Jordan Beard is Johnson's nephew. Jordan Beard is Jolie's cousin. Sergeant, will you just take her back, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Uh, this is another issue. I think the court at some point will have to address. She is, in fact, competent. Uh, she certainly is entitled to represent herself should she choose. So you may need to address that in a Nelson hearing at some point. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a convicted killer points the finger at his ex-wife, who's really... A Tennessee judge ordered Joel Guy Jr. to spend the rest of his life behind bars for stabbing his parents to death on Thanksgiving weekend. Law enforcement found his parents' dismembered body parts scattered throughout their home. His mother's head in a pot on the stove, his father's hands on the bathroom floor, and their torsos were soaking in barrels full of acid. He was convicted and sentenced to life for murder. The judge ordered he serves the maximum sentence for abusing their corpses. Just before Guy's sentencing, we learned a shocking admission made by the defendant. Terry Austin has more. And I've obtained a copy of a letter Joel Guy Jr. wrote to the court. I have to say it's truly remarkable. He writes, I'm having fantasies of using my fingers to gouge this gentleman's eyes out of his head while he's unconscious and therefore wouldn't defend himself. The defendant goes on to say he would be a threat to the general jail population and that he's psychologically unstable. A spokesperson for the jail says he's in isolation and is only allowed out of his cell for one hour a day. The victim's grandson spoke about the impact the murders had on the family. My papa, he won't be able to ever see her get married or my mom get married or me and my brothers graduate. But in the end, we all push harder because we know he is watching. At the end of the day, we are all family in the Bible that says, and we stand praying if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven forgives you of your sins. With that being said, I forgive. Yes, all of our lives have been changed and there is hate and there has been many tears to the point where I can barely even cry anymore. But nothing can be changed. They are gone and I believe with my whole heart they're in a better place together. The judge said the defendant was pure evil and beyond rehabilitation. This guy was stabbed 42 times uh, in his torso, and this guy over 30 times. Uh, this was uh, a crime of, I want to say anger, but I'm not sure it was. This was just a, a crime of this pure evil overkill. Uh, and he was sending a message to his parents and perhaps to his family through his actions. And then the steps that he took to try to dispose of their bodies um, was, uh, was beyond anything that, that would be necessary to form a piece of the corpse. Uh, and so I certainly find that the circumstances in this case were aggravating. Wow. So, Terry, this isn't the first letter the courts have received from Guy Jr. What are reactions to this letter? You know, I think he's just doing this as a ploy to keep his cell without a roommate. You know, he wrote an earlier letter saying he wanted the death penalty because he thought that would keep him in a cell without a roommate. And the judge didn't, you know, buy that. And the judge said this was just a maneuver. And so I don't think the judge is going to buy this either. But I will tell you something, Brian. I think they're going to keep him in a cell by himself no matter what.
Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Terry thinks it's a ploy. But, Dina, we know the prison has to take it seriously, at least for the sake of the other inmates. Do you think, as, as uh, Terry believes, this is a ploy uh, to kind of get his own space? Or do you truly think he has these murderous thoughts? I agree with Terry. This seems to be a ploy. For one thing, he does not have a cellmate. So when he says, I want to gouge them out when they're sleeping, it's a complete lie. And his family has said he is intelligent, he is manipulative, he's clearly here trying to manipulate the system. But the system does have to take this seriously because they do need to protect the other inmates. You know, so you don't want to see somebody like this who's committed such a horrific crime get his way, but he might. Yeah, I definitely got to play it safe because the last thing you need is a couple eyeless inmates because of this defendant. Thank you both. Still ahead, the murder trial of pizza order at Domino's to Lord Biggs to her death. I remember her saying somebody else's name. I remember it was a... Uh, I was still over by the tree. Were the kids all still in the car when she made the phone call? Yes, sir. As far as you know, did the kids ever leave the car? No, sir. Cobb says he was outside next to a tree when Stefanko placed a fake pizza order. He says he watched as Big's car pulled up to where they were waiting. With everything that was going on, looking back, she wasn't happy to, to, to see me, that's for, for certain. What did you do with Ashley's body? When I had to leave, I picked her up and put her in the car. Whose car? Ashley's car, in the back seat. And when you put her in the back seat, did she have anything on her that, that was placed on her that she didn't have on her when she arrived? Yes, there was, a zip tie. How many? I only remember one. I remember one around her neck. Cobb says he loaded the victim's body into her own car and drove her to a bridge behind his parents' house. It, it, it's, it's our bridge, and, and that's why I drove there. Uh, it's very difficult to explain. That, that, was, that, that's, it's a very, that was a very difficult night. Uh, I was at the bridge for a moment. Erica was behind me, and it just I, I kept driving through the cornfield until I couldn't drive anymore. Where the image is panning, I kept driving down the edge of the field until I couldn't go any further. If I told you that her vehicle was located in this little section right here, would that, would you have any reason to, to disagree with that? No, sir. I parked the car and I, I left. I started walking back up towards the bridge. When we come back, is this confessed killer telling the truth? A major revelation on Cross and our analysis after the break. An Ohio man who confessed to killing his ex-girlfriend took a plea that spared him the death penalty. But now, Chad Cobb says he wasn't the only one involved in the death of Ashley Biggs. Erica Stefanko is on trial for the murder of a retired Army veteran, Ashley Biggs. Under cross-examination, Cobb says he wasn't the one that killed her. Was Ashley in her car when I drove it to our bridge in, in, in the field? Yes. Yes, sir. Was Ashley already dead? Yes, sir. Did you strangle her? I am not the one that strangled her, sir. I see. So now you pled guilty, and now you're saying that you didn't kill her. Is that right? Yes, sir. You drove the car to the far end of a cornfield, correct? Yes, sir. That cornfield was pretty far off the road, true? Yes, sir. I, I don't know how, uh, how far, but a decent walk. The defense pointed out that Cobb only implicated Stefanko after she filed for divorce from him, leaving him for his friend and former boss. Sir, at the time and still currently, I'm under a life sentence, so them getting married really neither here nor there. I mean, one part. Did you and Erica 
ever plan to kill Ashley Biggs? No, sir. At your sentencing, when Judge Jones asked you if you had anything to say, did you say anything about Erica? I told the judge that there's a lot that I need to say about this, but there's very little that I can. Mr. Cobb. Yes, sir. I'm asking you specifically, at sentencing, did you ever mention during your sentencing allocution anything about Erica Lyon? Again, I said that there's a lot of things that need to be said, but there's so little that I can at that time. Cobb's seven-year-old daughter allegedly was in the car at the time. She's now 15, so we're not going to show her face. But she says she remembered hearing the defendant order a pizza. She was mentally abusive and physically. I remember she would hold me on the ground and she would hit me. And then she also before made me eat dog feces. Do you know why she made you eat dog feces? because she was jealous of my relationship with my father. Do you have a memory of Erica making a phone call? Yes. She, I can remember her, and I remember hearing it but not seeing it. And she, I know she ordered a pizza. I don't remember what she said that was on it. And I can remember that she did not use her name. Do you remember what name she did use? No. Do you know where you were when you heard this phone call being made? In the back of a car. So it was you, you said KC, AL, Erica, and was there anyone else? That's all I, that's all I recall remembering seeing. Dina, let, let's start here. As a defense attorney, you can't plan or prep for, a, for a, a witness to take the stand who pled guilty to murder and now says, I didn't murder the person, H how do you think the courtroom reacted to that and how would you react to that as a defense attorney? It's a prize for the defense attorney because there's very little evidence linking the defendant to this crime. A big piece is this man saying that she was a part of the crime. His whole credibility now has been called into question because like you said, he's already pled guilty to the crime. Why now he's saying he didn't do it? You, as a juror, you may just dismiss outright everything he's saying. I mean, literally, Terry. I can see the defense attorney looking through their notes, being like, "Oh, you didn't commit the crime? Forget my cross examination. Let's <laughs> let's go down this rabbit hole." But let's address the elephant in the room. Cobb pled guilty to murdering Ashley Biggs. That he now he's saying he didn't. Where do you think the defense gets to go with this on summation? You know, here's what I'm going to say. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I agree with Dina. You know, one lie is enough to question anything he has said and to question all the truths that he said. There's no question in my mind that Cobbs absolutely murdered Ashley Biggs or else he would not have pled guilty to it. And, you know, while I think Erica Stefanko was definitely involved and she definitely made that call and lured Ashley to the scene, she wasn't the one to kill her. And I think what the defense is going to say is, look, you can't believe anything this individual has to say. So obviously my client, meaning the defendant, wasn't involved in this. So I think it really helped the defense and it really absolutely hurt the prosecution here. Dina, I know it's like kind of a small detail, but I feel like it, it, it's playing a big part here in the trial. This whole pizza order, You've got Cobb saying it was half pepperoni, half mushroom, and that's what kind of threw him off. You've got the daughter saying, you know what? I don't really remember it, but I remember a pizza order, which seems to be a weird thing to remember when you're six. And someone else said it was all pepperoni. I think it was a pizza manager. With these different stories not really lining up, where does that leave Stefanko? Like you said, it's very odd that, you know, a criminal trial is going to hinge on a pizza order. If I'm a juror, I'm going to dismiss actually a lot of that. I mean, it's possible the daughter saying she heard it is probably the most relevant here. Whether or not you believe a child at seven years old, like you said, is going to remember that so distinctly seven years later, 
You don't know, right? That's why there's not a ton of evidence here. I don't think they're going to convict or not solely based on that daughter's testimony. They're going to find have to find something else also linking her to the crime. Uh, thank you for joining us here at the Law and Crime Daily, everyone. Make sure to come back and talk about justice in America.